Malaysian Airlines needs no introduction. This infamous aircraft cost the lives of over 200 passengers and cost more than $90 million in search efforts alone. And so a year after this incident happened, we ask ourselves the question, how is it possible that in today's modern age, our interconnected age, we can actually lose an aircraft? Well, the answer is pretty simple. And that's because we rely on ground-based technology, ground-based radar in order to track aircrafts. And this technology is completely ineffective a few hundred nautical miles out from a ground station. And what this means is that when you're flying over the Atlantic or over the Pacific, nobody has any idea where you are. So the next logical thing is satellites. Satellites are the only way that we can achieve a global picture of where these aircraft are. But satellites themselves have a fundamental limitation. And that is when an aircraft wants to pass its information up to a satellite, the satellite needs to travel around the world and downlink its information when it's in within line of sight of a ground station. This, what this translates to is only two hours a day for a satellite in low Earth orbit with one ground station is it able to downlink information or uplink commands. There is no real-time data link that exists between a ground station operator and their space assets. And this is simply not good enough for applications that demand real-time access to spacecraft. So how do we solve this problem? Well, what if we did something that we've already done here on Earth? What if we did something that's led to the proliferation of mobile telecommunications that we all take for granted today? What if we built infrastructure in space? What if we built a cell tower in space? A network of satellites that other satellites can relay their data through and they can get it down to a ground station in real time, providing that 24-hour connectivity that is in vast demands for applications like aircraft tracking. This is our vision. It's a constellation of satellites, 50 satellites, that is going to solve the aircraft tracking problem. That's going to give us a tool in the infrastructure and able to create a map in real time of global emissions monitoring. It's going to give satellite operators the ability to connect with their assets in real time for command and control. Now, why today? I think everyone in this room or the majority of people in this room have seen a plot that looks similar to this. This is the number of satellites that are going up every year, and these satellites are going up exponentially fast. Driven by standardization and miniaturization, not only are the number of satellites going up, but the amount of data that these satellites are both generating and attempting to bring down is also going up quickly. And every single one of these satellites that, is go that are going up, they face this same bottleneck. They cannot get their information down in real time. So, well, satellites exist now. We all use GPS, we all use Google Maps. How is it that we get our data down now? And why haven't we solved this problem? Well, we get our data down in one of two different ways. The first way is that we'll put up ground stations. We will spatter the Earth in ground stations trying to close this latency gap. But the problem is, is that for satellites in low Earth orbit, you cannot physically put up enough ground stations in order to cover the entire planet. There's too much ocean. And so for the best networks that exist that are going to be only deployed in 2017, what this translates to is about 10 hours a day where you can actually communicate with your satellites with latencies that range between 10 and 40 minutes. This is simply not good enough for real-time applications. So the next logical choice is, well, why don't we use communication satellites? These large monolithic mainframes in the sky, they exist currently and they're providing communication services. The problem is, is that these are based on 15-year-old technologies because they have 15-year design cycles and they cost tens of millions of dollars to build. They simply don't have the data rates in order to service this need. And moreover, because they have these long de design cycles, you can't scale this infrastructure. You can't scale it to meet demands. And this is insufficient. So our solution is the Kepler CubeSat. This is our space cell phone tower. We're all familiar with the CubeSat platform. These are small, low-cost platforms that allows us to achieve scalability. This allows us, by using this platform, we're not afraid to use today's technology. And that allows us to get high data rates. Today's technology, like phased array antennas, which we've currently uh, developed for applications for nanosatellites. So how does this compare to the current existing paradigm? If we look at ground stations on the left, while they're able to achieve the very fast data rates, they simply don't have that global coverage that we need. And conversely, the traditional large satellites, while they're able to have that global coverage, they simply can't provide that data rate because they're not a scalable technology. 
Conversely, if we're using a constellation of small satellites, we're able to achieve both the high data rates as well as the global connectivity. And letter of intent after letter of intent, this resonates well with our customers. People that are saying that they see an application for this that will not only affect their bottom line, but will improve their operations as a company. So how does, this, how, does, how does the market look? We charge our customers as a pay-as-you-go model, similar to a mobile subscriber. For $20 a minute, which is currently the going rate for connecting to a ground station, if we assume some nominal communications time of 5%, what this translates to is $50,000 per month per customer that we're generating in revenue. And if we scale this out to 2020, when 500 of these, of these nano satellites and small satellites are going to be launched, we have the potential of reaching 200 million in annual recurring revenues. But by itself, this is insufficient. The reason this is insufficient is because we understand that an infrastructure project, particularly a space infrastructure project, the market is going to lag development. The market is going to lag us developing this infrastructure. And so in order to address this, we need to make this space scalable. So the first thing that we're going to do is we launch one satellite. With a single satellite, we can address terrestrial needs. We can provide store and forward data services for polar applications, transporting high volumes of data from these underserved regions. With 10 satellites in orbit, as we scale up, we're able to achieve data backhaul services, as well as Arctic and polar broadband, ser broadband services, providing a much needed connectivity or increased connectivity for these underserved regions. Now, where have we come and how are we getting here? We started this venture in May of 2015, where each of our four founders left their full-time jobs in order to pursue this venture. We filed a provisional patent over the summer. We signed a number of research agreements with academia in order to help develop some of our core technologies. We submitted a $300,000 application to the Canadian Space Agency. And as well, we developed some of our core technology, this is our phased array antennas, up to TRL level four. Right now, we've opened up a $1.5 million seed round financing on a Y Combinator safe. And I'm very happy to say that our lead investor on this round is actually one of our first customers as well. Going forward, we're going to be signing launch contracts as well as customer contracts. And we're going to be working towards developing or launching our tech technology demonstration mission. This is going to be two satellites in orbit that are going to provide not only a demonstration of our capabilities as a network, but also this store and forward data service. So we're going to be generating $4 million in revenue on these two satellites. After this, we're going to, we're going to uh, go for our $30 million Series A round of financing, and this is going to allow us to start deploying our network, generating between 50 and 200 million in annual recurring revenues, as I was mentioning earlier. Now, why do we have the capabilities to take on this lofty project? We have the capabilities because we have the best possible team. We have PhDs in computer networks, in telecommunications, in spacecraft design, in spacecraft electronics, in business development. And more importantly, we're advised by a board of advisors with over 60 years of experience, both in the telecommunications industry and the space industry, as well as those with past startup experience. So with that, we are Kepler Communications. We're here to provide real-time access to space, and I look forward to your questions. So is the primary market aircraft tracking or all sorts of data? Right. Analysis? No, absolutely. Good, very good question. So the aircraft tracking is really something that we see as an absolute immediate need. Um, it's, it's, it's not possible to serve the aircraft tracking market without this real-time data link. And so this is really, a, to us, it's an anchor tenant for, for this real-time application. But more importantly than that, there's, there's a whole host of applications that you can have from this real-time data link. So for example, uh, uh, I think recently uh, there was a Kickstarter campaign from a company, Space VR. Um, and these guys, their whole business model is based on being able to access their virtual reality platform in real time. A virtual reality platform is not overly useful in, if it's not in real time. Um, if, if you want to do things like, like ship tracking, or if you want to even be able, something as simple as being able to go to Google Maps, and have a live image. This is something that our infrastructure would enable people to do. So, so the aircraft tracking is, is one of the applications that we, that we see with, with this infrastructure existing. It's by no means the only one. Is your, are your satellites picking up signals from aircraft and assets on the ground, or are they picking up signals from other satellites? From other satellites. What do the other satellites need to be able to communicate with you? Right, great question. So actually, that is what our, uh, our uh, 
TRL level four is four. So what we're doing is we're actually designing a, uh, effectively a modem. It's sort of like a SIM card for satellites. Um, and it's something, it's, it's about 10 by 10. Um, and what that, 10 by 10 by about two millimeters. Um, and what that's going to allow satellites to do is connect to our network. So if they're putting this piece of hardware on their spacecraft, they're going to be able to connect to our network. But more importantly than that, this by itself is a standalone product. The reason it's a standalone product is because this will actually increase the data rates that they can communicate to a ground station with. So we're actually looking to sell this product before we start deploying our network. That's and what this, uh, sorry, go ahead. It's a much different approach than your competitors. So you're talking about uh, raising your 30 million and getting your satellites, start developing your satellites in 2020, but um, space flight's gonna have a whole lot of uh, ground stations and be, be offering a real, real near, near time access for the same price that you're charging many year many years earlier and um, also they don't force <coughs> force standardization on their clients mm -hmm. so they're working with the radios that you know the radio that they're already radios. using actually yeah. yeah so that's that's a really good point and the 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 key differential is the real time um, that is is uh, the value proposition that we're adding um, or the value that we're adding. So um, no matter what spaceflight does, they can't get real time. It, it's physically impossible. Um, you can't put a ground station in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, for example. Um, so um, while spaceflight is able to, to shrink their latency gap, um, and as I mentioned, that, that 10 to 40 minutes latency gap, that is what they're going to have with their best network, um, with the network that is basically covering the entire planet. Um, and so for these applications that demand instantaneously, they, they can't serve that need. So I'm missing a link then in your system. So are your satellites linked? Is it a network of yes. satellites? Yes. Are you doing this with lasers? No, we're not. It's, a, it's in RF. Okay. It's a long distance to be traveling between yeah, no. 50 satellites. That's a very space, good question. Right? It's a very good point. So actually, when we, um, uh, we, we did consider it, um, when we went down the trade study, if you want to do things like be able to communicate with, with simultaneous people, um, laser-based communication simply doesn't work. Um, you, can't, you can't rapidly switch between you know, multiple users. Um, and for us, that was really the big bottleneck. So we knew that no matter what we had to do, we had to develop the high data rate RF technology. That was an absolute need. Um, and so that's, that's the path that we, that we be, began exploring. So, so are your, when you brought up that slide of LOIs, are you, are you selling now, are you speaking with customers that are satellite operators, or are you speaking with their customers? Who, who are you directly selling? Those LOIs were directly from satellite operators. Um, these were satellite operators who said that this service would be beneficial for their operations. Do you have an understanding of how they would have to rework their engineering in order to fit your terminal? So um, the, we, we're working with uh, a couple companies right now um, as, uh, for, for hosted payloads for the satellite. So there's, there's three different, or sorry, for this, for this modem. So there's three different companies that I can't say uh, publicly, uh, but there's three different companies that we're working with right now who are looking to fly this as a hosted payload, and that's going to flush out, okay, how do we actually do, do the integration on, on this specific modem? Um, the, the premise is that it, it's, it's as simple as switching out the SIM card on your phone. Is, is sort of the, the level that we want to get to with this. What, uh, what are you doing in the regulatory area to make sure that you have? Very great question. So that was actually the very first thing. That <laughs> regulatory is always a hassle. Um, that was the absolute first thing that we started working on. We knew that was going to be a problem. Um, or a, not, not a problem, but a, a challenge. Um, so the first thing that we, we started doing was getting on the phone with Industry Canada, our, uh, the equivalent of SEC. Um, and, and begin working that through. So that is in process right now. It's obviously an ongoing process, but we're working through it. Um, as I said, it was the absolute first thing that we worked on. So you have waveforms and frequencies for your inter-satellite links, as well as different waveforms and freaks for your customer. Yep. And, okay, so um, what, what's your plan or, or time scale to get, uh, beyond TRL4 for this antenna? Right, so um, the way we're, a couple answers to that question. Um, the way we're developing our technology is very much an agile paradigm. Um, it's, it's rapid design cycles. So this, this current iteration that we have, um, we actually built it in three weeks. Um, so we went from you know, schematics to in hand in three weeks. 
Um, that's how fast we're able to sort of iterate on our, on our products. Um, what we're looking to do, as I said, we're talking with a number of, of hosted payload partners. Um, and so our schedule right now is to have this thing in orbit as a hosted payload before we do our technology demonstration mission, um, to have this as a hosted payload mission by the end of 2016. Um, and so after 2016 is we're gonna, when we're going to be able to start selling this as a, as a standalone product. Thank you. Just last, last question for you. Um, yeah. How many, you want to go to market in one or two years, two years, let's say. How many satellite operators are there in two years? Um, current projections is that um, by, by 2017, there's, there's going to be on the order of two to 300 of these form factor satellites being launched. Now, as I, as I mentioned, um, go to market for us is sort of a, a two tiered stream. Right. The um, question is, how, how much do you think that you can charge the two to 300 satellite operators that justify you know, 50 or 200 million? In, in revenue, oh, I see what you're saying. So that was based on uh, an assumption of uh, 300 by 2020. Um, but that's also including the terrestrial applications that we're serving as well. So that's including that the, the data backhaul services, um, the broadband services, as well as the, the, the store and forward services. As I mentioned, we, um, we do see that uh, you know, there is going to be that lag between when people want the service and when it's actually available. And so in order to close that business case, we're looking at terrestrial applications that have an immediate need.